sama untuk kelas internasional dengan pemateri dari uh, Kobe Jepang. Jadi ba- ba- kita sebut Bapak ya, Bapak Christopher. Ya. Bapak Profesor Christopher Gomez ini mengajar di Kobe University di Maritime Science. Beliau adalah supervisor saya waktu saya S3. Nah, di setelah UTS ini kita sudah sepakat untuk memberikan international course sehingga geomorfologi inilah yang dipilih sebagai course untuk uh, international course. Jadi don't don't problem with your English, don't be worry about your about your English karena Chris sedikit-sedikit Oh, there is a Can you mute the yes, correct. Uh, Don't worry about your English because Professor Gomez sedikit bisa bahasa Indonesia. Um, just, he is a really wonderful. He can speak many many language, Indonesia, French, also uh, Javanese actually. Somewhat bahasa Jawa dia juga bisa. Jadi jangan jangan apa jangan takut ya kalau ada pertanyaan. Please on cam karena biar oh, kalian kenal dan nanti jika ada pertanyaan <laughs> jika ada pertanyaan silakan di deliver baik lewat teks maupun lewat mikrofon bagus sekali kalau sudah bisa dengan menggunakan bahasa Inggris. Demikian monggo Prof Gomez ya. you can start now uh, I will uh, of my microphone ya. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you Aditya for this introduction and welcome to this first series of lectures and course, international course between uh, um, University of Kobe and UMS in Indonesia. Um, just a few more words uh, before we start. Selamat pagi, mahasiswa dari Indonesia, dari UMS, ya, assalamualaikum. Hari ini, waktu kami akan start kursus geomorfologi yang internasional, Uh, karena kursus ini itu yang internasional, saya akan bicara bahasa Inggris saja ya. Dan senanti kalau ada yang kita mau tanya-tanya, uh, bisa uh, tanya Pak uh, Saputra ya. Uh, karena dia ambil S3 di uh, New Zealand sama saya di sana, dia bisa bicara bahasa Inggris uh, lancar sekali ya. Oke, okay, thank you very much. あ、日本人の学生のためのなんですけれども、あ、これから英語だけの授業が始まりますけど、最近あ、インドネシア人にも言ったな感じで、あ、ま、いろいろな学生がフランス人もいるし、日本人とインドネシア人もいるし、あ
want to join, this is also a possibility. I think it's a very good training, especially because geomorphology is not taught that much anymore um, in Japan. And for this purpose, um, I have created, as you can see on the screen here, a KU UMS logo, and that will be the mark of our joint courses. If there is anything that you miss or anything which is going just too fast, I will post every single lecture on YouTube afterwards and send you a link so you can watch it again and again if you need to. So let's get started. Landform of the Earth at the Earth scales, and I chose for that one of the best uh, manifestations on the Earth surface uh, of the movement of the Earth, of the geomorphology changes, which is the St. Andrea Falls here in California, because the weather is very dry. You don't have too much vegetation, and also you can see the fault very well. Um, it's not being eroded so much all the time. Well, you have signs of erosion. Of course, you can see those here, the rills and the gullies, but the fault appears very well. And here you have the fault wall coming out. And I think it's fascinating to see how the Earth uh, energy and all those processes are being manifested at the surface. So uh, the course content in general, uh, there might be some uh, slight changes, but we start with landform and material of the Earth. That's the first class today. Then there will be a class on structural landforms next week. Then I will talk about volcanic landform, fluvial landforms, erosion processes and their measures. Then one of my colleagues at my laboratory, Palash Badak, will talk not about aerial landform, but most probably planetary science. So extraterrestrial moons and Mars and all of this. And then uh, there will be an example of applied geomorphology. And I didn't put my name in front of it, but that will be me doing this. Today, the class content, I will have first an introduction with a um, reminder of the scales of geomorphology. For those of you in Indonesia, that will be a reminder of what Pat Junun might have told you during the first set of classes. I will talk about the rock and geological cycles, divide two different types of main rocks, especially uh, when you think about uh, Indonesia and Japan. And then we talk about continent moving in landform. And so uh, next, uh, we're going to see, make a link towards uh, structural geomorphology. And this looks like it's very little, but it will be plenty for you to work on uh, during that lecture. I will take my water bottle because I'm in the air conditioning and I want to lose my voice midway. So let's look at that slide together. And you have the geological time scale on the left side and the crust and uh, the interior of the Earth here. And what I'm trying to show you here over the old period, historical periods of the Earth, from the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and Precambrian, then Phanerozoic right here, all of this is actually um, out of this very long history, when you look at the Precambrian, that starts right here. It's 88% of our history. And that's something which is very, very far away. Most of the geomorphology of that time, not most, all of the geomorphology of that time has disappeared from the surface of the Earth. Then you have the Phanerogeric that comes right here at the end. And on top, you have the last, the Cenozoic. And when you zoom in that small bit here of Cenozoic, we have all that part, again, that comes here, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. And out of this, we have this small area here, which is the Quaternary, when human starts to appear on the surface of the Earth. So look at this zoom, like out of those 10%, only a few percent here are the Cenozoic. And out of this all zone, 
the last Cenozoic year is 1.4 percent, and the 1.4 percent of the Cenozoic, we have like what 25 percent is Holocene, and maybe 10 percent of this 1.4 percent is the the uh, our period here. So it means that we are living on 0 0.4. 14 or 0.1 percent of the time is the time of the Holocene, the recent uh, history for the last few thousand years or million years uh, at the start of the Pleistocene. So it's a very, 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 very short period compared to the length of the history. And we look at this very short period because it's also very important uh, for us because it's the space we are living in. And when you look on the right here, when you look at a cross section of the Earth with the inner core, outer core, lower mantle, so you can see all of that here. And then we take the upper mantle and the asthenosphere, these small elements, and we divide it between the mantle, asthenosphere, the upper mantle, and the continental crust. So we are here at the transition zone at the, of the asthenosphere at 250 kilometers depth, here 70 kilometers depth. And this is the crust. To give you an idea, the deepest we have been able to dig is only a few kilometers deep. So we are very, very far away from even reaching the upper mantle or anything. We now don't know what have it is. And what interests us is this very thin layer on top right there. You see where I put my mouth, this is this very thin layer. That's where geomorphology happened, and that's where um, we research. If you were to think about it as um, a set of mathematical expression models, you will think about this science as a boundary layer uh, modeling, boundary layer science. We are really at the boundary between the atmosphere and the Earth's crust. So remember, Geology looks at very long time frame. We look at very, very short time frame compared to that, which is still thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years. So much longer than human beings lives. And we look at the area which is just at the surface, this thin layer and how it's working. So how do we get this thin layer and how does it change? Um, first, to give you an idea of, um, the scale of things again, um, look from the inner core down to the continental crust. If we put it over North America, uh, you can see that we'll go for straight from Anchorage here to uh, a place which is called Miami uh, in this at uh, this location, which I, you have heard of, I'm sure, in South Florida. So we have all across um, from uh, this part in Anchorage to Miami, which is a very long stretch, that would be the length that we'll have to cross if we wanted to reach the center of the Earth. And the only place we can actually, we're going to work is that small location here, the small continental crust. crust. So and that continental crust, um, how does it look like? Um, what is its structure? And what do we look at as geomorphologists? So look at the three graphics on the right here. Look at those three elements. Okay, so let's look at this mountain here, mountain building processes. So, the model building process here goes through different elements we are going to explain in a minute. But um, what is also important is that the place that we are interested in here, that continental crust or the crust in general, it's actually floating on the mantle. Nabila, Nabila, your mic is on. Can you close it, please? Um, The mountain here is being eroded. The mountain is being eroded here. Let me do a bit of housekeeping.
Okay, thank you. The mountain building here, as the mountain builds, it's creating actually these pockets of material. You can see all the diapir and the material coming up. And as this is coming up, the mountain goes up, right? And as it goes up, it's like, as it goes up, it is exactly like um, an iceberg. So basically, when the mountain goes up, the root is also extending here, uh, the limit of the moho. And when erosion processes are occurring at the surface, so you have erosion here, then this part actually is also reducing. So imagine that your crust is like an iceberg floating over the moho and over the asthenosphere here. And as the material which is being lifted up is being eroded and deposited into the sea, this in turn is also creating more pressure in this location. And it is what we call the isostatic adjustment, which is actually um, modifying the way the mountain is actually sitting or the, the crust is sitting on the asthenosphere and on the mantle. So imagine it's this iceberg and this iceberg is thinning in some places, then you have sediment or whatever is being moved, which is depositing in one place, it's being, becoming heavier at another place. So it's moving all the time, basically. Next, um, how is this process happening? So how do we get to see um, those different elements coming up and down? Uh, one of the main process is linked to um, plate tectonic. And plate tectonic is the engine on the surface of the Earth, which is creating this movement which in turn is pushing, compressing, or extending the surface of the Earth so that things can be pushed up or extending down, depending on where you are. So, and it doesn't work on its own, and that's why it's important. It works actually in combination with other um, cycles, with other systems. Just a minute ago, I was telling you that the Earth's surface or geomorphology is like a boundary layer science. So when you think about it as a boundary layer science, it means that it's at the boundary between different spheres. And that's what we can see here. So when you think about um, the origins being created, you have precipitation and erosion occurring, occurring towards the top here. And at the same time, in the ocean, you have other forms of material sed sedimentation and material movement. And all of this, which is being uh, powered by solar energy, powered by the internal energy of the Earth, at the same time, all of this is also being moved around by tectonic plate and in that graphic here, by subduction. So floor spreading, subduction, bringing some of those material down. And we know now that it actually, during the subduction processes, when you have water which is being trapped into the sediment, that water is also at the origin of a lot of the, we think, uh, earthquakes and some of the processes that help actually create built mountains and earthquakes like you have in Indonesia or you have in Japan. And in Japan or in Indonesia, you are in this type of margin where you have subduction and one plate, the continental plate here, is going on, uh, on top um, the uh, oceanic plate. The other way, a better way to say that would be to say that the oceanic plate goes beyond or deep underneath um, the uh, co uh, continental crust. And as this is being deeping here, this plan here is called the Benioff plan. And depending on how far the surface is from the Benioff plan, then you'll have different type of volcanoes. If you are very far away, you will have like volcanoes like Volcano Unzen in Japan, where the magma is very, um, how to say that? In Japanese, they will say neba neba. Um, in English, there, I'm not sure there is a word for that, but it's very thick, uh, very, thick, very difficult actually to have it moving. 
Um, and when you get closer to the, to the surface, like at Merapibo Volcano in Indonesia, where we are about 40 kilometers above the bed of plan, then the lava will be more like andesite. Andesite is also um, not uh, lava that will, or magma that flows easily, but it's not as explosive as um, rheolitic uh, lava or day site that you have at Unza. So if this this geological cycle, um, it is this cycle here, which is recycling rocks and moving things around. So think about it as a conveyor belt. Think about uh, those different plates moving one under another, creating mountain or destroying them. And once things go up, at the same time, erosion processes are moving and smoothing um, the landforms uh, all around. And this gives rise to what we call here the, uh, the rock cycle, which is recycling rocks at the surface, remelting it and rebaking it. So how does it look like? So you have first, if we start with at the bottom, our magma, which is magma coming up here, the magma is cooling, it's going up, it's creating loose landforms, volcanoes, mountains, and then it's being eroded. The eroded creates sediments. The sediments are going down the mountain, and then it's being sedimented at the bottom um, of the mountain. And all of that is being subducted, transported, compressed. Then you create metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks are created either by pressure or heat, or a combination of the two. And then there is a melting, and then the magma goes back to the magma. And then it's being recycled and recycled again and again. And that's what we call the geologic rock, um, the, well, the, the rock cycle, sorry. And the rock cycles go hand in hand with the geological cycle, which is right here. And when you think about those different elements together, especially like, for instance, even if it's called the rock cycle, it's actually a, mix, a mix between the hydrological cycle here, atmospheric processes, and what's happening underneath in the ground. So if we were to make a division, you could divide rocks into many, many different types. But um, let's say for the sake of keeping things simple, Let's make a division between two types. So we have igneous rocks on this side and sedimentary rocks on this side. What we call igneous rocks are all the rocks that are created from magma rising up and because you are either most of you are from Japan or from Indonesia the first thing you would think about is a volcano like Mount Fuji uh, like Mount Merapi, Semerusa, Melbabu, Apalagia like what you can see here you can have this kind of volcano with a volcano conduit bringing the material to the surface but it's not the only type of igneous rocks. You can have other types as well. And some of those give rise to this kind of landscape here. So how are those created? Well, it's very similar. You have what we call batholites and dikes that brings material towards the surface, but the magma didn't quite make it to a volcano. It created a pocket somewhere in the ground. And that pocket cooled down. And after it cools down, it becomes a hard rock. And all around it, you have sedimentary rocks, like you have here, those different layers. And those sedimentary rocks are not very strong. So what's going to happen is that those sedimentary rocks will be eroded first. It's raining on top of it, and then the material gets eroded, transported. And what remains 
are some of the hard rocks that you can see right here. And depending on the shape of that you can have, you can have here this kind of volcanic neck, which is almost like a small mountain, quite spiky. And you can also have this kind of table type. Uh, if I'm looking down, it's because I'm looking at my screen while I talk to you. Um, this kind of mountain here, it's not a mountain, sorry, this kind of uh, landform, which is going to be the landform like a table. And that's what we call a mesa uh, from the, the Spanish word. So you have different type of landform being created by the different type of intrusion. So when you think about igneous rocks, think about those that goes up and come out at the surface, and think about all of them that get trapped underneath, but didn't quite make it to the surface. So those are rocks that are created within the earth or going up, going from the earth. And then you have the sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are very complex. There are many, many of them, but think about them as being created at the surface of the, uh, of the earth. Some of them can be created by microorganism, by bacteria that modify the environment and create rocks. Some of them are the results of the transport of sediments, and all of this is being piling up at the, uh, underneath the water. And with their own weight, then they become harder, and you can create limestone, sandstone like this. And if you look at this limestone here, you can see that you have a lot of different shells and other, a lot of different fragments. So you have the living organism that die in the ocean, then sediment at the bottom. They leave their shell that are made of calcite. And those shells being crushed and destroyed slowly create rocks. You have a lot of those in Indonesia, for instance, in the Baron area, uh, south of Yogyakarta. And you also uh, have them in Japan appearing in different places in the mountain. If you go also, I think, to Chiba, Chiba Prefecture, they also have some limestone there. So how do we know about those? What well, about those crustal movements? What are they? And I'm telling you here, there is a rock cycle. Yeah, great. And then I'm telling you there are different types of rocks. Hmm, that's good as well. But how do you tie the two together? How do you know that those rocks are created this way? And how do you know the way um, our planet is working? So how did we get there? Well, um, I'm not going to make the old history of geoscience here, but what we use are evidences at the surface or underwater of crustal movements and what we call the magnetic reversals. I'm sure you have heard of all of those already in your geology classes before. So the way it works, if you look at the graph at the bottom, you have this mantle here, which is buku, 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 like really hot and trying to escape. And one of the places where it's escaping and getting all the steam out, if I can say this way, it's not steam, but it's the way of saying it in English, like you lose your your, your energy. It's at this crustal ridge here, at the, the mid-Atlantic ridge, for instance, where the basalt, which is a type of rock, type of magma, is coming out. And that basalt is expanding and pushing the lithosphere left and right. And that's an extension location. And because it's extending, and it's going to push on the other side, on the other component plate, and then it's going to push and create mountains. And we know that because we have those sub-oceanic rich evidences. And you can imagine that finding those took some time because it's not something that you can observe at the surface of the Earth. You need ship and you need equipment to be able to look underwater very deep. 
So actually, this knowledge only dates back from the 1960s. It's a very, very new science. And when you look at it in detail, you can see these kind of elements where you can see the ridges, and you can see that there are different volcanoes that are associated with them as well. And those volcanoes usually will stay and then will move around with the continental plate. There is one place, however, where you can look at those and you can see the, the Earth opening. It's in Iceland. And I wanted to go, but um, it's my parents who went on holiday there. Um, and they took photographs. And you can see this photograph here. I have like plenty others if you're interested. Um, you can see this opening here. This is the gap where the Earth opens. And the magma comes out, and then the crusts are going away. If you are in Japan, or if you are in Indonesia, you cannot see that because you are in this subduction area where things go together. In Iceland, that's the place where things go out the other way. The other evidence that we use is what we call the magnetic reversal. So rocks are recording magnetic data of the Earth. And what we found is that along those ridge, parallel to those ridge, we have a lot of different bands that record the modification of um, the Earth's magnetic field. And they are parallel to one another. So this is the new one here. And then you have one magnetic reversal in here, another here, another here. And that's what was used to actually start to think about this movement from being away, thinking that the crust, which is the most recent one, is right in the center, while the older material is on the other side. And once it has been dated, you have this kind of map that I'm sure you have seen before here, where you have in red everything which is zero to two million years old. So around that ridge here, oh, around that ridge here, around that ridge here. And then the more you go away from it, you see, then you are 37 million years old. And then when you go into the blue colors, everything which is blue here, it's much, much older. Like away from Japan here to the south of Japan, we have 140 million to 200 million years. In Indonesia, the south here, we have something similar as well because we are very far from the production zone. We are in the place where things go up, go next, next to each other and underneath one another. And those are the process that create the landform at this planetary scale. So when you think about planetary scale geomorphology, you have to think about those processes, those large process that create the mountain, that create the trough, et cetera. Now, next, we're going to talk about the crustal movement and the birth of the crust in more details. But now it's uh, 10, uh, uh, 11, I think. In, it's 11, sorry, in Japan. My computer is saying 7 in the morning, but it's not right. Uh, so uh, we're going to take five minute breaks, OK? So it's 7.02. I will see you back at 7.07.
And we are back. Okay, so let's continue with crustal movement and the birth of land forms. So um, I was telling you just earlier about the movement of plates and what we call plate tectonic. And because of this plate tectonic movement, let me see if I can do something like That's much, much better. So because of plate tectonic movement, then you can see that the land forms 135 million years ago, before that 225, 465 million years ago, must have been very different also because the land masses were in different places. So you can see China, Siberia, Gondwana, Laurentia, Baltica, uh, there is no Japan or no Indonesia. Those are new countries um, at this scale. Um, then you have the creation of Eurasia, North America. So continent moved back together. And then it started to separate and you start to see a bit of how a world look like together. You can see North America, which is moving out. South America moving out. Africa has a shape already. And so does Antarctica. And Australia is right there, still in formation. And India is still an island. And then things continue. And you can see India, which is moving, and it's going to move up into the Asian continent. And as it move up in, moves up in the con Asian continent, it's going to create the Himalayas right there. Australia continues to go up. So it goes away from Antarctica. So it's very funny when you think about Australia, it's really very hot, very warm. You never think about Australia being attached to Antarctica being so cold today. And then you have the European continent and North America also developed this long ridge here uh, towards the, the south as well. And today we have, of course, here Indonesia and Japan right at the end here, which is being detached from uh, China. And all of this is the result of um, the plate movements with subduction and the divergence at the mid ocean ridges. And then when you look at the major plates, well, you have the African plate, which is being right there in the center. Uh, this is a map which has been created by Western people. So they like to put Europe and uh, North America right in the center. Um, if it was made by Japanese or Indonesian people, we would center it on Indonesia and Japan. So my apologies for that. It's maybe not the best adapted play, uh, map for you guys. And then you have those different plates with different limits that you can see right in there. So those limits that are jagged like this, you see like looks like a staircase, those are the diverging limits. And then you have those limits here that are the subduction zone, like what you have south of Indonesia and what you have here following uh, old Japan. And this area here is what is called the belt of fire because it's a place where you find most number of volcanoes and the most number of earthquake and movement. And incidentally, uh, in Japan, this is where you have this, uh, the first, the fastest um, plate subduction. And the second fastest plate subduction is right south of Indonesia. So those two countries have a lot to share in terms of science when it comes to hazards, when it comes to geomorphology, because their construction over the geological time period is very similar. I was asking you how do these joints work here? And let's look at them in more details. So because this is a geomorphology class, not a geology class, what is important here is the landform itself. So when you have the ocean spreading, you have the creation of the ridge, and that ridge is not like a simple uh, cut into the ground. You're going to have the, even if the rocks at the surface can be deformed, they are still quite hard and they're going to break in different pieces. And you have the creation of this kind of actually um, irregular breaking 
um, around it. And that creates those different ridges uh, all around. And then it goes into subduction. When you look at it from the top, that's how it looks like. And you have what we call the fracture zone with the transform fault. So the transform fault moves things like this. And then you have the transform faults on the other side where things move on the other direction. So you have things moving this way. And because you have transform fault across, things also move like this. And you can have also volcanoes appearing in the middle of those as well. And these boost processes can be seen when you compare the volcanic active volcano map and the edge of those different tectonic plates. And you can see those different edge with sometimes some volcanoes on top, but those are still very few. And most of the volcanoes will be on the subduction zone. So around here, look at Indonesia, a lot of volcanoes. Look at Japan, a lot of volcanoes as well. So you have actually a combination of the two together. On that map here, we divide volcanoes. We have what we call the subduction zone, when one plate goes underneath the other. And then there are the collision zone. So I didn't talk about collision zone yet. We have subduction, like here, or like in Indonesia, or, when, or in Japan, when the oceanic plate goes underneath the continental plate. But when you have two continental plates together, like it's the case here. There is nobody wants to give up or give ways. So they all face each other and they built up this way. This is what we call collision, like two trucks banging one face to face and that creates this kind of mountain. But the most uh, powerful boundaries that create the mountains are the subduction uh, areas. Like you have, with India, when India went goes underneath the Eurasian plate, you can tell me, oh, but India is is a, is a uh, continental crust. Actually, not. India is part here of the Indian plates, and it goes underneath. Um, it goes also for uh, here the uh, Andes, and for the Andes, you have the Nazca plate that goes underneath the South American plate and create that huge chain of mountains. And then on top of that, you have here the hotspot. I didn't talk about hotspot either as well. So hotspot, when you think about the hotspot, think about Hawaii. Hotspots are very particular. They use a weakness in the crust. There is a place where it's quite weak, where there is a crack, there, there is something that allows the magma which is underneath to rise through the crust. And just at this location, the magma for some reason is really, really doing its work well, boiling really hard. And it keeps actually creating volcanoes at this location. And as the magma goes up and the plates are moving on top, it creates a volcano. Then the plate moves, then creates another volcano. Then the plate moves, then creates another volcano. So you have like lines of volcanoes and that's how Hawaii, for instance, is being created. Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean, it's typically this kind of uh, hotspot. And I think I have a slide about this. Yes. So this is the newest island in, in this area. Those are the future islands. And as the um, plate is moving, so you can see you have two directions, which is quite interesting, actually. You have the Emperor Seamounts uh, sea going, going next, but you have those volcanoes which are being created out of the magma coming up at those hotspots. The magma that comes out here is very, very dark. It's very black, very different from what you have in Indonesia and what you have in Japan. The reason for that is because the magma is being non-differentiated. So when you have a magma which is not differentiated, what does it mean? It means that when it goes up, it doesn't mix very much with material like sedimentary rocks. You remember sedimentary rocks? Those things here. 
sedimentary rocks. When the volcano goes up on land, on Java Island, on, in the, on um, Sumatra, uh, Sumatra Island, or on Honshu Island, it goes up and it mixes the material which is being on from the island. But when you are in the middle of the sea, like here, there is nothing to mix with. It's just actually the, the oceanic plate. You see that you have the oceanic plate which is being created here from the ridge, and then the city and the material moves away from it. And when it moves away from it, there is no continent. There is very little, there is a bit, but not a lot, a bit of material production from the sea, but not that much. So when the volcanoes or the magma is rising to create Hawaii islands, then it doesn't meet anything else. It's just by himself. And what it does is it doesn't mix. So you have mostly basalt, which is a very dark and hard black rock. And the basalt, because it doesn't mix, is very fluid. And it creates those huge volcanoes. They are not very high, but they are very, very, very wide and they are creating a lot of lava flow. And that explains the difference between the volcanoes that you have in Japan or in Indonesia um, with, compared with uh, Hawaii, because the type of rock is very different. There are, however, some exceptions. Uh, when you look at Izuoshima in Japan, which is a volcanic island, the island has been moving with the plate from very, very far, and it's created with a lot of basalt, like Hawaii, but now it's getting closer and closer to Japan. So very close to Japan, you have a Hawaii type, more or less, close to um, type of magma that is coming in. Uh, there are differentiation at uh, Izuoshima, it's not the problem here. Uh, let's say that you can have actually those type of volcanic islands that continue to move and get closed back by the continent. But by and large, if you have to use a rule of thumb, uh, you know what is a rule of thumb in English? It means that it more or less, it's sort of general rule in uh, um, to explain things. Volcanoes that you have at sea that are made of basalt are very large and not very tall volcanoes. And a volcano that you have on um, subduction island arc, like Indonesia and like Japan, those are explosive and they are much taller. So what's happening in terms of the construction of the landscape? Let's talk about the processes. So one of the, I've talked to you about, when we look at this map here, I've told you that you have the Himalayas right there, you have the Andes right there, you have the Barisan in Sumatra, and you have the, no, uh, the Japanese Alps in Japan. And those are due to the subduction of the material. So that goes back to this, no, this one. You have the subduction of the material. And when you have subduction, then you have magma rising, you have like some, you see, I wrote here metamorphism, so like the material is being crushed, pushed together, and this is going up as a mountain. But once you have said that, you need to be able to divide the different processes and ask the question, what is happening? And to do that, we use um, systems of thinking that comes from civil engineering, um, geotechnical engineering, where we think about those movements as stress and strain. So if you apply stress on a mass of rock, on a square of rock, and that stress is actually tension, so going out, you're going to result into stretching. So your landform is going to actually thin the center while you are pulling out. I think that if you use um, a piece of, um, not paper, but something which is like chewing gum, 
a gum and you pull on it, you're going to see it's going to stay in center. Oh, by the way, I have a basalt. That's the basalt from Izooshima. So you see, that's a very hard and dark rock. Sorry. Um, so when you pull on it, when you pull on your rock, the resulting strain is going to show stretching. So when you are on the surface, the geomorphology, it's going to look like a thinning of the crust. When you pull apart, you have like less material thinning. So that's what is written here, thinning of the crust. Or you can also have faulting, material breaks, and we'll have normal faults. These kind of normal faults will result from the stretching. Another form of stress is compression. So things get pushed together. And because you have shortening, or well, that's easy to do with, with a piece of paper, then it's going to bend. And that bending, that shortening, is going to create folding. Or if your material cannot bend enough, it's going to break. And it's going to create what we call here a reverse fault. Then finally, the last one is shear. I must look ridiculous when I do that. <laughs> the last one is shear. And the shearing is going to actually twist laterally your work. So you will have bending horizontally, or you have strike and slip fault. So if you go back to this location here, you can see that the ridge of this location, because we are going apart, we're going to see those different elements. And we're going to have the expression of all of that in the landscape as well. So. Those are the differentiation of one process and one process and one process. But in nature, they all happen together. There is not one thing happening, then another one or one or the other. Very often, it's a combination of a different type of stress together, pushing and twisting. If you have two forces that push on the side, it's not going to only push straight, it's going to do torsion and move in different direction. So think about it as most of, often the shear will come with the stress or with the compression as well, compression stress as well. And very often your rocks will look like this. So imagine each layer, which is here, was once horizontal, like this piece of paper, and then means being pushed together then all the uh, layers are being folded and fractured. So we can have like different folds. And once things are being pushed far away on top of each other, things move and moving against one another, it's what we called a thrust fault. And that thrust fault happen over what we call the fault plane here. Sometimes the thrust fault is also named after the French naming, um, nappe de charriage. A nappe de charriage is also used in English because uh, that process was found in some French acts at first. So or very often, depending on where the science occurred first, you have those names. We're gonna see later on that you have Graben and Horst, those are German words because the German worked on that at first. And they have left those wordings uh, in the language. Um, if you are in Indonesia, the word laha, which is a debris flow on uh, a volcano, the laha were observed and explained first in Indonesia. So the word has remained in geomorphology and in science. In Japan, the word tsunami is used everywhere because Japanese people and Japanese scientists worked on tsunami and observed tsunami uh, for the first time and they left their research, the name, into the international field. So depending on where 
the research is being done first, or we, if you have a professor that was very good in one field or another, then the word will remain in the international scientific community. So if we go back to um, our uh, series of folds, uh, you have different names depending on how the folds are made. So when it's rising like this, it's what we call an anticline. And the opposite, when it's bending down, when it's going down, it's what we call the syncline. And it's important to notice that it's not the topography. This is not the topography. It is how the layers of the rocks are being bended. And those bends have axis, and the syncline axis is going to be this one here. So if you think about your layer bending down, that's a syncline because it's going down, and the axis is right here. If you have the opposite, you have an anticline, and the anticline is pushing up, that's going to be the axis. But remember, this anticline can get eroded. You can have erosion, and that anticline can actually look like this at the end with a valley at the center, but it's still an anticline. It's not a syncline because the layer where actually a geological layer like this, but the topography looks like this, and this is due to the erosion. So it doesn't change as an anticline into a syncline. So when you look at this mountain here on that side, you can see that it's on top, but the layers are going this way. So it's creating a U shape. So it's still the syncline. And that's why we call the syncline ridge in that case when it becomes a ridge on the topography. And on the opposite, the anticline can also have valleys. And that's what we call it an anticlinal valley. And then if you complexify, if there is more complexity, it's more, uh, more different, uh, a lot of different other changes. You can have also what we call an overturned anticline. So the overturned anticline here, it means that the layer is being pushed and it's falling down. So it's being pushed and it's falling down on the side. So it's being pushed and falling down on the side. This is what we call an overturned anticline. And when we have quarries, so we have large outcrop, we can see this line. You see, it's beautiful. You can see the layers here going up and down, and you can see here the folding. So you have an overturned anticline that must have been here as well. You can see here that location, it's a synclinal ridge in Western Maryland, because the layers are doing a U shape, like here. You have a U shape in the layers. But it's on the ridge, because you have a small mountain. So this is called a synclinal ridge, like what you have here, synclinal ridge. Next. When your material can be compressed and can be deformed quite easily, you have all this movement. But when it's a bit harder, when the rocks are not, don't tend to uh, bend so easily, you're going to have more fault creation. And as we were talking about a second ago, when you have tension, you're going to have this kind of normal fault happening. And on the fault, this location here is called the fault scarp. 
and that plane is called the fault plane. Actually, very often we can talk also about fault mirror, not only fault plane, but fault mirror. And in the landscape, that's how they look like. You can see that line here. You have tension going in that direction and that direction, and you have the creation of that fault. And this place here, is the wall which is higher than the other. And this is the wall which is going down. And when you look at it from this direction, you can see this is the lower part. So it's this part. Oh, my system is very slow. Okay, this is this part, the hanging wall side. And at the back here, you can see the foot wall side, okay? Now, if you have compression, the hanging wall is the one which is on top, and the foot wall this time is the one which is underneath. So remember, when you have a foot wall and a hanging wall side, it's not about how the topography is higher than the other. It doesn't mean that the hanging wall is hanging higher. It's because the hanging wall is on the top of that plane. So if the plane is like this, the hanging wall is on that side. If the plane is like this, the hanging wall will be on that side, regardless of the topography. So you have the hanging wall on that side, the foot wall on that side. And if you were to look at it, you would see something quite similar as well. You would need actually to uh, get more uh, information uh, on uh, that wall, because the wall by topography wouldn't stay like this, and you will have some changes. And then the last type is the shearing type that we talked about earlier. And the shearing type is also happening on um, in California. And here you have shearing as well, where the two plate move there like this. And you can see that fold, which is right there, this is the movement that we are looking at, okay? So remember, out of the tectonic processes, mostly the tectonic processes, you're going to have two types of landform creation. One will be through folding and the creation of those different ridges, one after another. And then you'll have go, you're going to have also a lot of faulting. And by the way, if you're interested in this, you can have a look at the work that Aditya Saputra has done uh, south of Jakarta in the Bantul area. Um, and it's not only the Bantul area, but you can ask him about details. And he worked on um, using photogrammetry to look at how the fault moves against one another. It's a very interesting work because you can really see those different movements. And you can see one, which block is higher than the other. So it allowed him to reconstruct the movement of the all area and how the different faults have been moving together. Uh, it's a read that I recommend. It is also a very beautiful posters, a series of posters uh, with graphic in it that are very easy to understand. So if you're interested in that, go and talk to him. So if we zoom on something that interests us more, which is the subduction, both in Japan and in Indonesia, um, and if you take, for example, the example of Sumatra Island, what is happening then is well, that when you have the mantle going down, then you have the creation of this mountain three, through this kind of process and this kind of processes as well that generate here the Balisan mountain in this location. And there is a zoom here on uh, Muralalao Bo. Yeah, Muralabo. And Muralabo, you can see actually the movement of the plate. And you can see that you have actually different faults uh, acting against one another, while you have also opening segments uh, in some of these areas, like here in this segment. If you're interested in the geology and geomorphology of Sumatra, yeah, there is a very good book, which was written now a few years ago, 
uh, which is published um, by the British Society of uh, Geology. And uh, this is uh, something I suggest you can go and have a look at. There are some very beautiful plates explaining how the geology and the uh, tectonic processes generate the landform right over there. So those are compression landform. What happens when things go the other way around? Well, we talked about it a minute ago. I was telling you about the German words Horst and Graben, and I will talk about it in now uh, maybe five more minutes. I'm going to take a break because it's 7.37. So we have talked about 30 more minutes. I'm going to take five minutes more break. So see you in five minutes. And back. Okay, so we talked about compression landforms and landform creating in subduction zones. Um, when we think about the geomorphology of the other side, where you have actually the opening, you have like in Ethiopia here, the Red Sea. The Red Sea exists because the the Red Sea exists because the plates are uh, opening one another, and the lower end here is being filled with water, but that place which is being filled with water is a graben. And in between the graben, 
you can see those places because it's going away, then the blocks are falling down. Then you have what we call the host, which are the high place, which is exactly what it means in uh, German. Host means something which is like a high, a high and graben, something that is falling down. So similar processes actually happen also on volcanoes. So I chose a volcano that I'm working on in Japan, which is Unzen volcano. So this is Kyushu Island, which is the main South Island. There are three main islands and a lot of the smaller islands. Like Indonesia, you have like some main islands and thousands of um, smaller islands. And on Kyushu Island, you have here uh, Unzen volcano. Right here, you have also Aso volcano, just in case you know about this place. This is the Sakurajima at the bottom. And today we're going to go to Unzen volcano. And on Unzen volcano, we, are, uh, we have a dome here, which is a sliding dome from the last eruption. So the last eruption at Mount Unzen was between 1990 and 1995. And the dome kept piling up at the top, like we can see here. I'm not about going to talk about the volcano and the volcanic activity today, but what is interesting is that this volcano is piling up a lot of material. And it's not because there is extension, but the material is being heavier and heavier because you have more and more material from the volcano. So the volcano is going down at the same time. You remember the first thing I told you today about isostasy? I'm going to go back. Isostasy and the isostatic adjustment. So while the volcano is being created, at Mount Unzen is the same. Mount Unzen is being created. The magma goes up. You have your dome and material being created. So the volcano is going down. It's sinking. And that's its sinking. When it sinks, it sinks, creating faults. And you can see them here. You can, oh, I want to use that thing again. I cannot find the height here. Okay. When it's sinking, you can see that you have the different elements right here which are the limits, and it's being broken with a series of faults. And those faults actually let the volcano go down. And if you were to look at that, you can see that the bottom now is much lower. And it's separated by a series of faults. So this here, is a graben. So the volcano is going down into a graben. And you can see the limits of that graben in the landscape. If you look at the aerial photograph here, that line, I don't know what this is, that line is the limit, one of the fault limits that we have actually, it's somewhere here. It's one of those fault limits. And you can see it on the LiDAR data. So the top of the ridge is around here. And you have the lower part of the ridge. It's doing something weird. And this is the part here, which is going down in the gravel. And you can see it also on the geological map. So you have all the units which are here, which are now higher. You have the fault, and you have new units, young units, which are right there. You see F is the young gravel, the young fan. So as the volcanoes is erupting, the material is going down. There is something wrong with that application. It's creating those V-shaped stuff. I'm then going to go back to my ferret. 
And this is also happening. So that was for Japan. This is also happening in Indonesia. So if you go to central Java, where you have Merapi volcano, so Merapi volcano is going to be, I don't want to write again. It's going to be around here. Here you're gonna have Merapi volcano, here you're gonna have Merababu volcano. And next to it, you have the Borobudur basin, where you, here you can see Borobudur temple. And all of this is also a graben. And what we did a couple of years ago, you can see I have different numbers on that map. Um, that's, I think this is number three near Cariello and Cariprovo, which are the name of the rivers. We did a whole a core, which is 110 meters deep. And what we found at the bottom were actually material from the Merapi volcano. So what was happening is that you have in this area, the Borobudur uh, Basin, which is going down as the Merapi volcano is erupting, exactly like what you have um, at um, Unzen volcano in Japan. So the volcano, which is here, is erupting. You have material which is spinning up. And because it's heavier, then it's going down, OK? And when you look at the series of material, we have actually a different lake, different elements that show that the environmental change, but it shows also that all of that has been piling up and going down, going down, and going down slowly. So it's not like the material is being eroded away. The topography is the same, but all of this is slowing going down. And when you go 110 meters deep, you have material which is that we dated with. Uh, uh, KAR as being 361,000 years old. So the material from the volcano, which was 360,000 years old, was at the surface before, and now it goes down and down. Okay? And it's the same process. What you can see here is the volcano, which is sinking because of its own weight. So when it continues erupting, it continues to go down and create this kind of graben, what we saw here, this kind of graben. And here, it's because the material, in that example here, you have the material going away from one another, but for the volcanoes, it's the volcano creating material, which is pushing down the material under its own weight. Now, just for a training before we finish this session, try to find the fault and tell me where it is. So if I had to look at this, where is the fault? So I think that the fault will be maybe somewhere here in the landscape. And this location, that will be the mirror of the fault or the scarf. Let's check. And that's how it looks like. And in that location, this material is going up. And that's in the Death Valley um, in the US. Another example from where I come from in France, you have here limestone beds from the Carboniferous. And you have here actually a fold. So I invite you to try to find the fold. Can you find the fold on that photograph? Actually, it's quite easy because the vegetation is showing it. So you can see that line here and going down. Can you remember how we call those kind of folds? When well, folds, when the folds fell on the side, let's have a look. What was the name? Overturned. So what we have here is an overturned syncline as well. Let's check. Here we go. That's where it is. Okay. 
for today, but because it's going to be the end of the lecture, what do I want you to remember? First, geomorphology is only concerned with the thin film at the surface of the Earth, and it's created by the interaction between endogenic forces. Endogenic is everything which is inside the Earth, and the combination with atmospheric processes. So it's really the limit between the two. And then landforms are, over the long run, the products of the Earth's internal processes. So when you think about long-term scale, it is what we saw today, subduction, material like going front to front to one another, or material like going apart from one another, which is creating the main large-scale landform. Crustal movements generate two main categories, landforms, compression landforms and expansion landforms. Those results in either building of material, so going up, or actually the low-lying landform, the gaps. And you remember I was saying here the kind of thinning also of the crust. And those are the elements um, that lead to the next lecture, which is going to be given by Aditya Saputra, where we'll explain in more details the different landform that we call structural landform. And it will give you all the names of this explanation of like, how do you call this kind of type of landform, light type of landforms, depending on those processes that we saw today together. So look forward to the next lecture. And if you have any question, you can ask me or you can ask Aditya. Kalawa dayang kamu tanya tanya bisa tanya pa Aditya bisa tanya saya juga ya. Dan si vous voulez demander quoi que ce soit, vous pouvez venir me voir à la fin ou me contacter. Mo shi nani ga wakara nai tokoro ga atta la. Ma sore zehi atashi ni kide kudasai. で内容自体はそんなに難しくないと思いますけれどもいつものか日本語の授業にしか受けてない方々にはちょっとなんか英語になれるためにとかその英語で使っている言葉を慣れた方がいいかなと思っているのでまた自分でいろいろ勉強して今回の授業と今後の授業もまたお楽しみにしてください。今日はそれで終わりになります。Today will be the,、uh, that will be the end of the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.